So let's uh, bring on our first speaker tonight. We have three people coming up tonight, and our first speaker is Jose Cordero. Some of you may have met him. He's going to be doing a book signing after the presentation. He's an internationally acclaimed engineer, economist, futurist, and transhumanist who has worked on areas including economic development, international relations, Latin America, the European Union, monetary policy, comparison of constitutions, energy trends, cryonics, and life extension. Jose has written several books, but his latest, The Death of Death, is now available in English. I've read it. It's an excellent read. You want to get a copy for yourself. And as I mentioned, he's going to be doing a book signing after the event tonight at the back table here. So please make note of any of your questions for Jose, as there will be a 10-minute question and answer period after he speaks. Let's bring up Jose Cordero. And I want to tell you a few things that have been going on since last time I was here. I had the pleasure to present uh, my book in Spanish uh, about five years ago. And the world has changed radically in the last five years. Uh, longevity research has been advancing exponentially, so I'm really excited. So I, I just want to begin with uh, showing you a few of the things I have done myself in terms of longevity in the last five months, which I, I find truly fascinating. But before that, to put it in context, uh, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin, very famous, I love him, but he said, in this world, uh, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes. And I think he was wrong. I don't like taxes, and I like death even less. <laughs> and we should get rid of taxes and death. So I just came yesterday from an experiment worldwide, which is called Vitalia.city. Vitalia, and you can see the goal of Vitalia is to make death optional, death optional. 200 scientists, researchers, investors, scientists, biohackers are getting together in this island in Honduras to make death optional. I was there for the first two weeks. Um, it plans to be the uh, Los Alamos for longevity, to create a warp speed movement towards curing aging. Actually, people like Brian Johnson go there for some therapies which are not allowed in the USA because the FDA is a horrible bureaucracy. So Brian Johnson was there a few weeks ago for some therapies like folistatin therapy. And I gave a talk um, on Sunday uh, about what is happening in my book in the next few, few days. Before going to Honduras, I was in Argentina with the president of Argentina. And actually, uh, you can see him with my book and I'm really proud. He said it is his favorite book. He has the Spanish copy of my book from five years, and he has in the center of his own personal uh, library in his home. And he is the first president who is an immortalist, who is a libertarian, and who even cloned his dog. <laughs> when his do dog died um, uh, five years ago, he I, I was talking to him in 2016, uh, that his dog was aging, and, and then I said, why don't you clone it? And he did it. In 2017, he cloned his dog. No president has done that. And besides that, what I love is he's an immortalist, and he is also a libertarian. Before Argentina, uh, last days of November, first days of December, I was in Saudi Arabia for the first time. I was in Riyadh for the big announcement from Evolution Foundation, which begins with an endowment of $20 billion. And they announced the Longevity X Prize that begins with $101 million. Um, I was there here with Peter Diamandis and my friend Dan, Dana Marduk, who is also collaborating with me in another initiative that I will show in a minute in the Middle East. Uh, the Evolution Foundation, this is the highest prize ever in human history, $101 million that should be uh, given to the winner by the year 2030. There are seven years for any startup companies, universities, uh, to compete, to be able to rejuvenate people between the ages of 65 and 80, at least 10 years in three biological systems. The immune system, the um, muscular system, and the neurological system. And this is an incredible goal, and I think we are going to do it because, in fact, some of the competitors in this prize are people so important like George Church from Harvard and MIT. And George Church said, live from Saudi Arabia, 
that he wanted to win the prize. And then uh, Eric Verdin, who is the director of the Buck Institute in California, he said, no, 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 we will win it. So there is a competition from many top people on this, and this will revolutionize uh, the science of longevity. And before going to Saudi Arabia, I was in November in Dubai, in the Museum of the Future. They are now very interested in longevity. And I gave a presentation with top scientists like um, James Kirkland, who is one of the experts on senolytics at the Mayo Clinic, and Alex Shavoronkov, that has one of the biggest companies in uh, drug discovery using artificial intelligence called in silico medicine about immortality. So Dubai also, the United Arab Emirates are very interested, at, and in, um, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, they were really fascinated about the idea that we can reverse aging. And before going to Dubai, uh, we also organized with my friend Anna Marduk this uh, worldwide network state called Health Jevity, which is health and longevity. And we basically uh, want to invite you to join this journey and to become ambassadors, ambassadors of immortality. This Health Jevity nation is going to use the idea of exponential organizations that we developed 10 years ago at Singularity University to democratize health throughout the planet. We are going to have a health jevity coin. We are going to have health jevity courses, health jevity school, health jevity university, health jevity centers. We will open the first health jevity center in Vancouver, Canada by the end of the year. We are going to have health jevity cruises also in the Caribbean and in the Mediterranean. And we plan to have a health jevity parliament and maybe a health jevity president. So this is moving very fast. So I invite you all to join this initiative that has been born two months ago in the Middle East. And another initiative that I am supporting totally is vitalism.io. Let's make freedom from biological aging and death human, humanity's number one priority. More and more people are understanding that this is real, this is scientific, and that we are getting closer and closer. Before that, on October 1st, we celebrate International Longevity Day. In different parts of the world, we had different um, activities. I organized a conference and then a rally in Madrid where I live. In Madrid, we went to the most famous place in Madrid, which is the City Hall of Madrid, which is where Real Madrid, the best soccer football team in the world, celebrates. Real Madrid. So in this fantastic place, we actually began the march. We had a rally, a march in the City Hall. We had beautiful uh, shirts and balloons. I, my balloon dropped there, but I have some balloons so, so that you can see really beautiful balloons, and we had T-shirts about this. Uh, we went to the state government. We went to the Congress of Spain, to the Spanish National Congress, and then we finished in the uh, Madrid office of the European Parliament. So this is becoming more and more important also in social sectors, in political sectors. And before that, the Longevity Escape Velocity Foundation, led by Aubrey de Grey, announced the Dublin Longevity Declaration. This is the biggest effort led by scientists, 100 top scientists throughout the planet, saying that we can cure aging, we can reverse aging. And there are thousands of other people. All of you are welcome to sign it, please. Dublin Longevity Declaration. And before that, I was in the most interesting, biggest event for immortalists in the world, which is called the Revolution Against Aging and Death. And I invite you all to join us also in September this year. In, uh, it will be in the same place in Anaheim, Los Angeles, 2024. So uh, Bill Falloon will be there, of course, and uh, people like Liz Parrish, Aub uh, Aubrey de Grey, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now let me tell you a little bit about me. I was born in Venezuela, which means Piccola Venezia. When uh, my parents left Spain, my family is originally from Spain, but they left Spain when Spain was poor and a dictatorship. And Venezuela was wealthy and a democracy. So that you can see how fast things can change. Because Spain is no longer a dictatorship and is not a poor country, while Venezuela is very poor and a horrible dictatorship. Anyway, so I left uh, Venezuela. I was an advisor to Irene Saez Conde, who was uh, uh, a presidential candidate in the last free elections in 2018. It sounds like, excuse me, 1998, 1998, a long, long, long time ago. Anyway, so the beauty, she had been Miss Universe 1980, 
Irene Science Condit, Miss Universe, and so she ran to be president, but it was not the beauty who won the election. It was the beast, the beast, Hugo Chavez. And so because of that now, eight million Venezuelans have had to leave Venezuela. But anyway, um, I was lucky enough to study at MIT. I was working before in energy. Now I am totally devoted to longevity. I am devoted to longevity, not 100%, but 200% maybe 300%, I only do longevity-related activities now, only. And my goal in life is to kill death before death kills me. <laughs> and I think all of us, all of us should do that. Uh, I also lead the Millennium Project, which is the biggest um, futurist think tank in the planet. It began with the United Nations University, even though now we are an independent NGO. And I coordinate the efforts for Latin America and Spain. And we publish uh, books about the global challenges, uh, reports like this one that we presented at the United Nations uh, last year. And we talk about the year 2050 uh, with three scenarios. In one of those scenarios, by the year 2050, we are immortal. So we are taking this to the United Nations so that people know that this is really not only possible, that we are very close to reaching biological immortality. And I also coordinated a study about 2013 in Latin America. I presented that at the famous World Economic Forum, Davos in Switzerland, Switzerland with uh, people like the Nobel Prize Mario Vargas Llosa, who wants to be immortal. By the way, he doesn't want to die. Uh, he's like 85, and he's looking for a third wife, by the way. Uh, so he wants to be rejuvenated. He believes in this. Anyway, in 2009, I was one of the founding faculty of Singularity University, where we talk about these things. We talk about biological re rejuvenation. And uh, the idea was popularized by my dear friend, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is also from MIT. And he, he says that basically technology is advancing exponentially and soon we will reach the point of the singularity. In fact, by the year 2045. And at that time, we will reach the singularity and immortality, immortality. As you can see, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. But for the ladies here, also women will become immortal. All of us, <laughs> all of us will become immortal. Why? Because technology is changing, advancing exponentially, faster, things are smaller, cheaper, and better. Um, and this began with technology, science and technology at the end, at uh, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century to the 19th century. Before that, we were in the Malthusian trap. There was no economic growth until the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in the 19th century, there was incredible economic growth, 100%. In the 20th century, 400% economic growth. And in this century, it's probably going to be 5,000, 6,000. We are truly living in incredible times. The first country that doubled its income per capita in history was the United Kingdom. And it took 58 years between 1780 um, and 1838. 58 years to be the first country in history to double its income per capita. Now countries have been learning, learning, learning. And today we know how to double the income per capita. In only 10 years, if a country does the proper things, we can advance economically. But population is stabilizing and it is beginning to decline in some countries. Actually, since last year, we reached peak China and the population of China is declining and India overtook China. The population of China, it is estimated to drop to less than half what it is today, from 1.43 billion to only 700 million people. This is if, if like the population of the USA disappeared twice. So not only China, the population is declining. In Europe, in Japan, in Russia, the population is already declining. In India, it will stabilize soon in two decades, and even in Africa, it is going to stabilize in three decades. So it is a myth that there is overpopulation. In fact, there will be soon underpopulation in the planet. However, the good news is that the economy keeps on growing. This is what has happened in 200 years of uh, economic evolution, GDP per capita. In the year 1800, was about $1,000 per person per year. Today, it is over $10,000 per person per year. 
And some countries like uh, Ireland, Qatar, Luxembourg have over $100,000 per person per year. And the trend is that this will continue. And look at the scale. It is logarithmic scale that implies exponential growth. So the economy keeps on growing, uh, even though the population is stabilizing. You can look at the Dow Jones Industrial Index. It is growing exponentially for over two centuries. World War I, World War II, COVID, anything. It keeps on growing, and it will continue. The economy keeps on growing exponentially. In fact, we are moving from the economies of scarcity into the economics of abundance. There will be more and more. We will produce more and more with less and less resources. Even life expectancy is increasing. At the time of the Roman Empire, life expectancy was less than 25 years. Who has here 24 or less? No one. So all of us could be dead on average at the time of the Roman Empire, all of us. I could be dead twice, uh, twice and a half almost. I could be dead. But I am not dead, also I don't plan to die. But look how interesting, life expectancy keeps on increasing. And what grows the most is education. And that is why the world is changing, because we are more educated, we know more, we can do more things. And this will only continue. We will continue increasing life expectancy and education. This is happening exponentially. And I like to make the big difference between linear change and exponential change. If I give 30 linear steps, each step of one meter, after 30 steps, I have walked 30 meters. But if I walk exponentially, after 30 exponential doublings, 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 I have walked over 1 billion meters. I'm going to plan about planet Earth 26 times. How many of us understand this? We don't understand this because we think linearly, but technology is changing exponentially. So we have to get ready from a change from the local and linear world into an exponential and global planet. Everything is changing. All the companies from the past are being overtaken by companies of the future. At Singularity University, we used to say, Uber yourself before you get Kodak. Uh. We need to see that the change is coming in every industry. So I'm a futurist, and futurists, we talk about four ways to think about the future. Passive, like the ostrich. You don't want to see what is going to happen. You hide your head. Horrible. You suffer the future. Horrible. A little bit less bad is to be reactive. You react when there is a problem. Like the firefighters, they come when there is a fire. It is better to be proactive, like when you buy insurance for cryonics, for example. But the best thing is to be proactive, because we can create the future. We can construct the future that we want. So I hope that we don't have ostriches here, because ostriches are not really from Florida. But if we have ostriches, they should be technological ostriches that use technology to see what is going to happen in the future. 40 years ago, when I went to MIT, I used this technology. This was the punch card, IBM punch card. This is basically 10 by 100. There were different sizes, but 10 by 100, that makes 1,000. This was 1K, 1K of memory. I used this at MIT. Fortunately, right after arriving at MIT, the first electromagnetic memories were invented. This is one of the first ones, 8 inches and also 1K. But this 1K was better because you could erase, and it had a bigger hole. But 40 years ago, we had 1K, in Spanish we say 1K plus 1K, 1K plus 1K makes 1K, 1K, at MIT I use K. In fact, I wrote my first thesis at MIT on a K technology called typewriter. I don't know if, they, if you remember, in the museums, the K technology of typewriters. Anyway, so we move from a caca to a 512 cacas to 1.4 mega. And here I have a pen drive of one terabyte. One terabyte. In 40 years, we have gone from caca to terabytes. What do you think is going to happen in the next 20 years? 
In the next 20 years, you will remember me, and you will remember caca. But this will be caca in 20 years. One terabyte will be caca in less than 20 years, yes. But now this is moving from computers to biology, to medicine. The first human genome was sequenced between 1990 to 2003. It cost over $1 billion just to the US government and 13 years. Today, in 224, we will reach full sequence of the genome for $100 in one day. But that's nothing compared to what will happen, $10 in one hour. This is more exponential than caca. You know, caca is a caca compared to what is happening in biology. Biology is moving faster, faster than what happened in computer science. So I like to say that uh, I sequenced my genome many times with many companies. I will show you the partial sequence of my genome. A company like 23andMe does partial sequence. And you can see which diseases you will have. What is the, the, the risk, the risk of me having cancer, Alzheimer's, etc. Isn't it fascinating? to know what you might die of, so that you don't die of that, because the medicine of the future will be preventive, uh, based on your genes. But also, you will discover where you come from. You know, this is my paternal line several centuries ago, based on my genes. And you can see famous people related to me on the bottom right, uh, Genghis Khan. So no one mess around with me. <laughs> this is my paternal line. Now, I'll show my maternal line. And you can see my mother descends from Maria Antoinette. So I have a good, excellent pedigree between Henghis Khan and Maria Antoinette. All of you will know where you come from once you sequence your genome. Remember, $10 in five years. And uh, you will be able to verify for the first time if your father is really your father. Isn't this interesting? But Better than knowing the past is knowing the future. And so um, at Singularity University, I sequenced my genome and I shared it with my students. Uh, this, this was a theoretical experiment to see how our children would be and to choose the genes that you want for your children. This will be a standard in 10 years. Actually, let me tell you, all of you are here by mistake. You were not designed. None of us has been designed. In the future, we will be designed. And at the end of the day, we are not that complicated. We are only three gigabytes of data. Our genome is three gigabytes of data. This pen drive is one terabyte. How many humans can I fit here? I can fit 333 humans and a little dog in this pen drive. So we are not complicated biologically, only three gigabytes of data. And now we are moving from reading to writing genomes, writing. The first genome was written, artificial genome, was written in the year 2000 for a virus. Viruses are simpler, smaller. In 2010, the first artificial bacteria was created by Craig Venter and his team. At this stage, it is for sure that by 2045, we will get to the complexity of the human genome and we will be able to write and rewrite and improve and change the human genome. 15 years ago, I went to visit uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke, famous for uh, uh, science fiction books and movies like Space Odyssey 2001. And he was a genius, and he's one of the prophets of the Church of Perpetual Life. And he wrote the three laws of the future. First law of the future, when a famous scientist says that something is possible, he's probably right. But when he says it is impossible, he's probably wrong. Second law, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture past those limits into the impossible. And third law of the future, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So this is what the future brings, magic. We are going to have magic. 30 years ago, personal computers were really just beginning. 20 years ago, cell phones. 10 years ago, Google, Facebook, and other companies were becoming global. But what will happen in 10, 20, 30 years? We are going to have immortal cells, ageless cells, which has been the biggest dream of humanity since the beginning of written history. 5,000 years ago, the first book was 
the Epic of Gilgamesh about immortality in Mesopotamia. But not, not only Mesopotamia, the Egyptians, the Book of the Dead is about immortality. And the famous Chinese emperor, King Shi Huan, that built the Terracotta Army, he was looking for immortality. Or here in Florida, Juan Ponce de Leon came here looking for the fountain of eternal youth. And in all religions as well, the goal is immortality. In all religions, like in the Bible, Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So now we just came back from this horrible pandemic called COVID. The number one risk factor, as you can see, is age. Age is the number one risk factor. And COVID was really a tiny pandemic, tiny, tiny pandemic, what I call a caca pandemic, a caca pandemic. If you really want to see a big pandemic, that was the bubonic plague. It killed one out of every three Europeans. One out of every three Europeans died because of the bubonic uh, plague. That was really horrible. Or uh, smallpox, 56 million people. A Spanish flu, which was not a Spanish and was not the flu, killed also, it is estimated, 50 million people when the population of the planet was much, much smaller than today a century ago. Those were really big pandemics. COVID is a caca pandemic, and it paralyzed the planet. How can a caca pandemic paralyze the planet when all of us are dying of aging? We are not dying of COVID. All of us are dying of uh, aging because aging is the number one risk factor of all diseases. If you compare different diseases, influenza, cancer, heart attacks, Alzheimer's, anything basically, risk factor number one is your age. Aging is the problem. It is not COVID. It is not the Russians. It is not climate change. Um, it is not religion. The problem is aging. That's the problem of, of all humanity. And also, we had considered different diseases separately. Now we have to consider them integrated and around aging. Aging is the mother of all chronic diseases. Aging is the enemy, the main enemy. If we stop aging, we stop heart attacks, we stop dementia, we stop um, uh, most cancers, etc. So the enemy is aging. So uh, also we have learned that uh, aging is very flexible. There are mammals like us, mammals that live uh, maybe two years, some, some mice, and then there are whales that live over 200 years, mammals. So how can a mammal go from two years another to 200 years? Or if we look at other animals, sharks. Sharks live 500 years. And ber uh, uh, trees, there are trees that live thousands and thousands of years. So there is a lot of flexibility in the aging, and now we are beginning to understand that flexibility of aging. So five years ago, my fantastic co-author, David Wood, who is a science doctor from uh, Cambridge University, and me, I, I studied in Cambridge, but Massachusetts, we decided to write a book about the number one problem of humanity, which I repeat, is not the Russians, is not climate change, is not religion, it is uh, even accidents. No, no, the number one problem is that we all, we all are dying of aging. So we published the book that I was happy to present here five years ago before the pandemic, and now this book from the, before the pandemic is a caca book. Caca book, because Technology has advanced incredibly in the last five years, incredibly. So uh, there were no, no vaccines, there was no mRNA technology, there was no CRISPR, uh, there was no alpha folding for uh, protein folding. Incredible things ha have happened in the last um, five years, which are here in this book that just came out, the Eng English edition. So anyway, we are donating the royalties of the book to two foundations. Uh, one uh, Sense Research Foundation, which was the previous foundation of, of Aubrey de Grey, and a half in Spain to a scientific foundation. The book uh, came first, uh, first in Spanish, then in Portuguese, then in French, uh, then in Russian. Uh, this is very interesting. In Russian, uh, it came in two versions. Uh, the, the one on the left sells 80% more than the one on the right. And, uh, and in Russia, they changed the name. In Russian, it is called Death must die. Very Russian. Death must die. 
So the book is in many languages, uh, and now it's coming out in Chinese for the Chinese New Year. I'm really excited. They also changed the name in Chinese. In Chinese, if you can read Chinese, it means eternal life. Eternal life. They don't like to use the word death in Chinese. So anyway, the book is a global bestseller, and I am so happy and so proud to be able to present it here because people like Bill Falun has written a beautiful testimonial, and he has helped a lot, in fact, in the Life Extension magazine next month, well, for April, there is a, an interview made with artificial intelligence to the book. This, this was a beautiful experiment. I didn't participate in, in the interview. It was artificial intelligence answering after reading my book. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. And, and the artificial intelligence answered very well. Actually, maybe better than me. So really fantastic what is happening and how artificial intelligence is hel helping us. The book now is coming out in, China, in Chinese because China is suffering a horrible demographic implosion. As I mentioned, the population of China is going to less than double, and China will be country number three by the end of the century. The country number one will be India, with less population than now because the population will also decline in India. But then Nigeria is growing very, very fast. Anyway, um, after this, the many countries, the population is going down or is stabilizing. Spain actually has the second life expectancy in the world after Japan, among the big countries. Of course, there is Monaco that has more life expectancy, or uh, um, Hong Kong. But among countries, big countries, over 10 million people, it is Japan with 85 years of life expectancy, and Spain with 84.5 years in the planet. So this is a very important issue in Spain and all over Europe. Life expectancy in Europe actually is five years more than in the USA. So this is a big issue because Europe is aging faster and it is already more aged than the USA. So I ran as a political uh, Spanish candidate to the European Parliament and I was really happy that I got over um, 7,000 votes in Madrid. And I can tell you, I don't know 7,000 people. So I was really excited that in a quick campaign for the European Parliament talking about aging, there was already so much interest uh, five years ago. My idea was to change the old lemma of Spain, that's the Spanish flag, that used to say non plus ultra, nothing far beyond, until America was discovered. When America was discovered, the name of Spain became the country of plus ultra, far beyond, something far beyond. But now my goal is that it becomes Vita plus Ultra, life far beyond. Because Spain is one of the top five countries in terms of research on longevity today in the world. And so the idea is to consider aging as a disease, but a curable disease. As I mentioned, I talked to the new president of Argentina about this idea. Let's see if he finally managed to convince other people in, uh, in Argentina, but that's good. that would be a fantastic example. One country, a big country like Argentina, declaring aging as a curable disease. In the last two decades, we have been able to extend the lifespan of mice two times, um, uh, mosquitoes four times, and some worms 10 times. So we have worms that live the equivalent of 1,000 human years, the equivalent in worm years. These are called the Methuselah worms because they live 1,000 years equivalent. And do you think scientists do these worms or these mos mosquitoes or uh, mice because they love mice and mosquitoes? No, because this is to uh, apply on humans, to apply on humans. So we are moving closer and closer to doing this in humans. In fact, today we know that immortality exists, biological immortality. And this was sadly discovered in 1951, not yesterday, 73 years ago. It was discovered when Henrietta Lacks died of a horrible cervical cancer. She was born in 1920, and she died in 1951 from a huge cervical cancer. And the doctors began analyzing the cancer, and they discovered that cancer, if it has food and water, it does not die. It does not age. It keeps on growing. That cancer that she had, uh, it's called the Hela, Hela cells, Henrietta Lacks, is alive. Over a hundred years, it's centenarian, and it is alive, and it reproduces like teenagers. Cancer discovered immortality. 
So when people tell me that immortality is impossible, I say, how is it impossible? It already exists in nature, and cancer discovered it. And cancer didn't go to university. Cancer didn't go to MIT. Cancer doesn't even know how to read. And it discovered immortality. So we are very close to understand what cancer does, now that we can sequence cheaply the human genome. But not only cancer is immortal because it's bad. The best cells, which are the germ cells, the reproductive cells, are also biologically immortal, which means that they do not age. That doesn't mean that they don't die. If the person dies, the germ cells in our bodies die, but they don't age. So it is important. Immortality already exists. We have immortal cells in our bodies. And there are a small immortal organisms, like hydras, like the immortal jellyfish, animals that do not age biologically. And the most beautiful thing, I believe, is that the purpose of life is life. The first life forms of the planet, bacteria, small bacteria, with run chromosomes, they do not age. During three billion years, there were bacteria that didn't age. Their telomere, uh, telomeres were round, and they didn't have, I, I mean, their chromosomes were round, and they didn't have telomeres, because they were round, no ending on the chromosomes. So these bacteria did not age. Life was born to live, not to die. So my dear friend, Aubrey de Grey, who wrote the prologue of the book, he has been talking about these ideas for 20 years. And he was called a charlatan by MIT. The MIT Technology Review called him a charlatan in 2005. They said it was impossible that we could not cure aging. Look at the incredible change of opinion of MIT Technology Review 14 years later. Old age is over, if you wanted, at the front cover of the same magazine, 14 year time difference. Actually, Arthur Schopenhauer, the famous German uh, philosopher, said it. All truth passes three stages. First stage, it is ridiculed. Second stage, it is violently opposed. And third stage, it is accepted as self-evident. In the future, we are going to accept curing aging as normal, self-evident, even if now people don't understand it. My dear friend, Ray Kurzweil, who also writes in the book, he talks about the three bridges to immortality in his book, Fantastic Voyage, Live Long Enough to Live Forever. And he talks about reaching longevity scale velocity between the year 2029 and 2030. So if we reach 2030 alive, we will gain one year per year we survive. So we will be living longer and longer even if it's still aging, even if it's still aging until 2045 when we will be able to rejuvenate. He just sent me the latest version of his manuscript of his new book coming out in June, The Singularities Nearer, which is a continuation of 20 years ago, The Singularities Near. And he keeps his two dates, longevity escape velocity by 2029-30 and immortality through biological rejuvenation at the latest by the year 2045. Because of the convergence of all these technologies, nano, bio, info, cogno, actually, we will be immortal not just once. We will be immortal twice. We will be immortal on the hardware side, and we will be immortal also on the software side. We will be able to read and copy our minds if we want. So we will be biologically and computationally immortal by 2045. All companies are beginning to understand that this is real. Google created Calico about 10 years ago, California Life Company. Um, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan are donating all his fortune, well, 99%, uh, to cure all diseases, including aging in this generation. Uh, and uh, if you prefer uh, Microsoft, Microsoft plans to solve cancer now that we can sequence the genome, we will find the mutations that stop aging in cancer cells. And Tim Cook, Apple, also says that Apple will be remembered, but what they will do in health, in health. And of course, uh, we have Amazon, Jeff Bezos, who is investing with other people $3 billion in Altos Labs, which is doing epigenetic reprogramming. Uh, in fact, this market is growing fast. It's going to be the biggest market in the planet over $8 trillion in longevity. And this is growing exponentially. It begins with millions, now it's at billions, soon it will be trillions. 
And this will be the biggest industry in the planet. Also, it will be a positive industry because there, be, there will be something co called the longevity dividend. Longevity dividend. Being young is better also economically than being old. So there will be actually a superavit, a fiscal superavit, no, as, no a fiscal deficit once we cure aging. And as I mentioned, what is happening right now, financed also par partially by countries like uh, the Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia, etc., cetera, is, is incredible. Even in the Middle East, they have discovered that aging can be stopped, that aging can be reversed. And they are working towards it. This, this price will change many things. And remember, the goal is 2030, to rejuvenate people between 65 and 80, at least 10 years by 2030. I don't know if it will happen, but the results, the research, the information we will gain will be absolutely fantastic. And the same, I repeat, in Dubai and many other countries. Last year, we invited to Spain the Nobel Prize in Medicine of 2012, Shinja Yamanaka. Uh, you can see Shinja Yamanaka, he is one of the leaders of Altos Labs, uh, which is the investment that Jeff Bezos, Yuri Milner, and other millionaires made. And he's working on epigenetic reprogramming. And we are convincing him to open the fifth Altos Lab Center in Madrid. And why Madrid? Because 20% uh, of the scientists working in Altos are from Spain. One out of every five scientists, only after Americans. Americans, then Spanish, and then British. So a lot of research has been doing on epigenetic reprogramming. Also, I explained this is fundamental. Today, we know that aging is reversible. There is even a Nobel Prize, and people don't know it. To me, this is absolutely frustrating that people don't know that we can reverse aging. And there are people who are doing this, like um, my friend, he was at MIT before, now he's at Harvard, uh, David Sinclair, who is uh, actually turning back time. That was the, the top, um, the cover article in Nature magazine when he, uh, his students, his lab people, actually were able to rejuvenate the eyes of mice. They took mice that were about 80 human years, and they were basically blind. And through a gene therapy with the Yamanaka factors, they regained their sight. Their eyes went back to age 20, from age 80 to age 20. And now, this has been replicated not only with mice, with monkeys. And in Japan, they are beginning to do this also with humans, with humans. I'm pretty sure we will be curing most eye diseases in the next few years. So my goal, as I said, is to kill death before death kills us, to be younger. And so I plan to be younger in the future not through a Russian application like FaceApp. No, no, I plan to be younger because I am committed, like I hope most of you, to biological rejuvenation. The goal is biological rejuvenation. And we will keep on evolving. Humans have not finished evolving. We will continue evolving. But we have to do it carefully, carefully. Humans have existed only 200,000 years. We are really nothing, nothing in the evolution of life in this planet. We are, however, probably the end of simple biological evolution and the beginning of sophisticated, complex technological evolution. So this is an incredible thing we are going to see, but this is very complex, so we have to meditate. I love meditation, different types of meditation. And uh, as the Chinese say, there is yin and yang. This is very complex. There is always yin and yang. So it's so complex that yin yang inside has little yin yang. And little yin yang has little, little yin yang. So also the Chinese say, let's light up the world. Don't blame darkness. The problem is not that we don't know. Uh, the opportunity is what we will discover. We need to light up a candle to illuminate the world. And I lived three years in Japan, and it went a lot to South Korea. And sadly, there is also North Korea. North Korea. Is, is a very poor country, as you can see, not illuminated, and with no public internet. It's the last country in the planet without public internet. While South Korea is the most illuminated country with the best internet in Asia. In Asia. So where do we want to go? To the future or to the past? We have the two possibilities there, going the way of South Korea or the way of North Korea extending to the past. And I want to basically finish with this beautiful Chinese word that means 
crisis, crisis in Chinese. First, I wrote it upside down or sideways. Now I know how to write it, crisis. The first character means danger, danger. But the second character means opportunity. We are living in the most incredible times of human history. We are going to see more technological advances in the next 20 years than in the last 2,000 years. I repeat, more advances in the next two decades than in the last two millennia. We have seen nothing yet of what technology is going to advance. We are between the last mortal generation and the first immortal generation. So where do you want to be? You want to be one of the last stupid people who die? Or one of the first intelligent people who overcomes aging? So come to Anaheim for revolution against aging and death. Uh, come tomorrow to Miami. I'm presenting my book in uh, Books and Books in Coral Gables at 6 p.m. And of course, read the book in any language. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We have time for a few questions. Jose, thank you very much for that. The first question is going to come from online. We have a number of people watching, and the question is, uh, what assessments have you made of the Blueprint Project promoted by Brian Johnson? What are your thoughts on that? Well, fantastic. We actually, as I mentioned, Brian Johnson went to Vitalia in Honduras, and he got injected with folistatin, among other um, therapies. And also, we, we followed his protocol. Uh, the people, the 200 people who are in this experiment, the city of immortality, Vitalia, uh, were following this protocol. I think it is uh, something that works, but it is actually very demanding uh, and also still somewhat expensive. Uh, but I think it is a, a good beginning, a good beginning. I love biohackers. Actually, I do some biohacking myself. I, I think this is good. Then we can discover things. But uh, diets are not the same. You know, he has a very strict diet. But that diet is not necessarily good for everybody because we have different organisms. Actually, um, also diets for women are not similar to diets for men sometimes. So it is a good example. I love what he's doing. He's actually breaking ground on this biohacking world, and he's putting millions of dollars of his own money. So I uh, actually applaud what he's doing. OK. We have a question back here. And here we go. Where was the question? Yes, go ahead, David. Yeah, hi, Doc. Uh, very much appreciated your presentation. Um, I almost yelled out when you were going through all the number one problems in the world with the pandemics and disease and global warming. Uh, I want to get your opinion on plastics, the latest uh, number one problem, plastics, and how do we address that? Um, well, I think we are going to solve um, most problems we have today. If we go back in history, when Malthus, Malthus said it was the end of the world two centuries ago, when London had one million people, and the Thames River was too, truly polluted, contaminated, and people had cholera in the streets of London. And thanks to technology, thanks to science, uh, we don't have cholera in London. The Thames River is clean again. There are fish and dogs in the Thames River. So I think we are going to solve all these problems also about plastic and so on and so forth. But again, something which is very important to keep in mind. In the USA, 90% of the people die of age-related diseases. 90%. Only 10% die of non-age-related diseases. And that includes plastics, global warming, the Russians, uh, religion, accidents, uh, suicides. AIDS, malaria, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are only 10%. Jose, I have a question from John back here. Thanks again, Doc. Fantastic presentation. Um, my question uh, has to do with um, what, do you, what are your thoughts? You've given us a very optimistic timeline on the uh, overcoming of biological disease and aging. As it pertains to what you just mentioned, accidental death, that's personal to me because I've got a two-hour drive on I-95 <laughs> after the meeting tonight. And, and what are your thoughts on the timeline for overcoming trauma-induced death at this point? Um, well, talking about the optimistic um, um, forecast, actually, in the book, I have forecast with my friend Ray Kurzweil until the year 2099. 
which is quite interesting to read in the appendix, what will happen in science and technology to the year 2099. I just came from uh, Naples uh, uh, to be here. I went to visit the Fountain Life Clinic, so I also had a long drive. And um, I don't like driving anymore, uh, because in Madrid, you don't need to drive. When I lived in California, I had to drive, and it is a pain in the neck. Now I think we are going to have self-driving cars very soon, so technology will actually um, be doing most of the driving, and I trust more technology than me. Also because if I'm tired, if I'm sleepy, if I'm drunk, you know, I don't want to drive. I let my car drive. So anyway, so my point is that uh, technology will solve many of these problems, like what you are saying, or like the plastics issue. All of these problems we will solve, like we have been doing for two centuries. Uh, I don't know if that answers, but uh, well, I am an engineer, so I believe in the power of science and technology. Thank you, Jose. Here's a question back here from Bree. Hello. I'm going to say it in English, but I am from Venezuela, so I can say it in Spanish too. Okay. It's very nice, but w do we have to wait until 2045 or something? Do you have something for us now? Um, well, first, fantastic question. And also, the future is really not written. Um, these are the forecasts mostly from uh, Ray Kurzweil, even though I also take some numbers for some extrapolation from Elon Musk, British Telecom, and some other groups that make forecasts. I try to compile all of, the, all of those, including the United Nations in terms of population. But in terms of the dates uh, for 2045, uh, for biological rejuvenation, of course, I want it to happen sooner. And you know why? Because every day, 110,000 people die of age-related diseases. Every day, yesterday, 110,000 people. Today, another 110,000 people died because of age-related diseases. So this is the elephant in the room. It is not plastic. It is not driving. It is not the Russians. The enemy is aging. So I want more people to be involved. That is why I am devoting all my time to communicate this and, and to help with governments and to help with social groups and to, to work also with companies, with startups, with universities. Because if we accelerate the process, it could happen earlier. So I want this to happen earlier. If you get involved, it will happen probably earlier, maybe in 2035. You know, to me, as an engineer, this is a technical problem. We, co we know as a fact that there are immortal animals. We know as a fact that there are immortal cells. We know it. We don't have to create or to pray. No, no, no. There are immortal cells. And cancer discovered immortality on its own without reading. So it is a matter of time until we understand this procedure. And the more people are involved, the sooner it will happen. But I understand your question. What can we do now? Uh, Ray, um, Ray Kurzweil talks about the three bridges to immortality. It is in the book, chapter five. In those three chapters, the first chapter is do what your mother told you. Eat well, sleep, do exercise, try not to smoke or drink too much, etc., etc. That's bridge one, until last decade, the 2010s. Now, in the 2020s, we have the first biotechnology therapies. Things like senolytics, like rapamycin, uh, maybe metformin are coming up now in this decade. Uh, foliastatin, which is what Brian Johnson injected himself in biology, because the human genome, remember, is three gigabytes. And our brains are too limited to understand these three gigabytes. But artificial intelligence helps us. So artificial intelligence will be the final point to cure aging. But again, now you are in between bridge one and bridge two. So do all your mother told you, and also do the first um, biotechnology therapies. And Bill Falun is an expert. And the Life Extension magazine is fantastic. If you are not members of the Life Extension Foundation, I get my products from the Life Extension Foundation. I recommend that to everybody. And to read the Life Extension magazine. They have fantastic articles about senolytics, about metformin, about rapamycin, about many things that are new. And some of them already happily approved in the USA or go to other places. You know, I love competition. If the USA stays behind, someone will do it. Thank you, Jose. And actually, Bree, uh, we have a speaker coming in a minute who's going to also address what you can do now. I have a question back here with Mary Ellis. 
Again, thank you for coming this evening. My question is, this is all wonderful and sounds great, but how do you get big pharmaceutical companies on board? Well, uh, you don't. Uh, I, I actually think this is a total disruption. And the disruption comes from outside, not from inside. And actually, one of the big problems is the pharmaceutical companies. They prefer to have you eternally sick than eternally healthy. So, and also the FDA, the FDA is a big problem. The Food and Drug Administration is so slow, so bureaucratic, and there are so many vested interests that it is a problem. That is why we need international competition. But now individuals are disrupting the medical sector. Just like Elon Musk disrupted the, uh, the transportation sector, you know, the electric car was not invented by Elon Musk. General Motors had electric cars, and then they eliminated them. They didn't want to compete with their own gasoline cars. So the disruption didn't come from General Motors. It came from Elon Musk. The disruption to space travel is also coming from Elon Musk, from Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin, with um, Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic. So the disruption comes from outside. And the pharmaceuticals are going to be disrupted. And, and this is already happening. Many startups, many small companies are growing incredibly fast because they are truly solving the problems. And this is unstoppable. When a small group of people, when a small startup uh, managed to cure cancer or cure Alzheimer's, forget about the pharmaceuticals. These companies will have the cure and people will take it. Great, Jeff. Jose, here's a question from Jeff. I saw that chart you had, that evolutionary chart, and I was wondering, uh, do you believe that human beings evolve from uh, a one-cell organism in the sea three million years ago, as many people believe, many scientists believe? Well, all the biological data goes that way. When you look at the genome, you look at the genome of uh, the animal species, uh, you can see when we actually separated from monkeys. Our separation from our monkey ancestor was about eight million years ago. The apparition of mammals, mammals appeared about a hundred uh, million years ago. Um, we were actually in the sea before life appeared on the sea. And we can see the evolution of the genome. And also when the, the trees, the plants separated from animals, all of this can be tracked through the genome. The genome has all the information of you and your ancestors. So, so yes, I believe in that because that is what science tells us today. If something is discovered later, I am open-minded. But today, to me, there is very little doubt that we come from monkeys and monkeys come from other mammals and mammals come from other animals and we all come from tiny bacteria who were immortal, by the way. Those first bacteria, don't forget that, were biologically immortal. They had run chromosomes with no telomeres. They, life appeared to live, not to die. Jose, we have one more question from the internet, and that is, what do you personally do to reverse your aging? Is there one or two things you can say that you do for yourself? Uh, yes, I am, uh, as you can see, 161. <laughs> Uh, and I plan to celebrate my 200th anniversary on planet Mars. So all welcome to Mars. Okay, no, seriously, what do I do? Uh, and I have a uh, 61 years old. Uh, I was born in 1962, soon to be 62. Anyway, um, what do I do? I do bridge one and bridge two uh, things. So bridge one, what my mother told me, you know, eat well, sleep well, or at least try to, uh, to do some exercise, not to drink, not to smoke, etc., etc. And then I take the first biotechnology therapies. As I mentioned, I buy many products from the Life Extension Foundation. I buy a coenzyme Q10, I buy NAD plus precursors, I buy uh, multivitamins, uh, multiminerals, uh, I buy um, uh, metformin, uh, many, many things that you can buy. Uh, also, senolytics. Senolytics are beginning to come. And then Life Extension Foundation has also senolytics. So uh, I will be actually tomorrow in the Life Extension Foundation to buy some, some bottles of things that I want for me and for my family. Because this is what we can do now in this second bridge to immortality. Then we will have third bridge, nanotechnology. And then we will have immortality with 
uh, artificial intelligence at least by the year 2045. So yes, you need to stay alive. Please, as Brian Johnson says, don't die, don't die. And my friend Charlie Cam actually has been saying that for a long time, and as you will see now. Uh, so don't die, because also Ray Kurzweil says, just hang in there until 2030. Because if you live it un until 2030, you will basically live long enough to live forever. Because we will be living one year longer per year we survive after 2030. So don't die, please. That's my advice. Ladies and gentlemen, Jose Cordero. Thank you, Jose.